Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History, U.S. History Edition. So, in today's unit, we're going to conclude our unit on growth and expansion by getting into a little bit of what this growth and expansion means for us as a nation within, but then also looking at the U.S. defining itself in a larger scape, which is the world, which is why the image that we're looking at is kind of perfect for this unit because where we're going to end things today is with the Monroe Doctrine which is really where we're going to see the United States begin to define itself in a larger context within the world. Before we get to our learning objective today it's kind of important that we lay out what's going on politically so that we can really see how it changes in this time period that we're going to study. So again we're going to be wrapping up our growth and expansion unit for students in my class. This is chapter 10 in our textbook, but it's also certainly a time period that um, we're going to see again. The foundation is going to be built for where we're going to be heading in U.S. history this year. And those of you who are coming along to learn, welcome, and I hope that I can help you learn something today. So the era that we're going to be talking about is this period right around 1816 is going to last for about 1824 and it's a time period that we call the era of good feelings you have president james monroe who's going to become elected president in 1816 with almost no opposition and the time period becomes known as the era of good feelings because as far as the political differences among citizens it seems to fade and so this is kind of an unusual thinking for those of us who are in right now living in 2020 because we do see some really strong political differences among our citizens as it stands today monroe also quite easily won a second term in 1820 and he again is going to play a really important role in defining the u.s on a larger scale particularly with his doctrine a little bit later. But he's going to win the vote with all but one electoral vote. So quite handedly, he's going to win re-election. That brings us to our learning target for today, or our main idea, and that's that I can identify the regional differences that brought an end to the era of good feelings. And so the era of good feelings begins to end as Americans developed an intense allegiance to the region in which they are coming from. And we call that sectionalism, which again is that loyalty to a region. And the regions that we're starting to see develop in the United States are the North, the South, and the West. Now, throughout this unit, we've been talking a little bit about the economic differences, but you're also going to see some political differences start to arise here. You're also going to see that some issues start popping up that help to define those identities. So states' rights being one of them. It's going to become an issue as the North and South begin to differ over specific issues on a political scale. So among them is you're starting to see some dispute on the institution of slavery. Remember we said the Northeast is beginning to industrialize, and we know that in the South, especially with some of the new technological innovations like the cotton gin, that you're seeing a renewed need for slavery in the plantation system that the South has largely adopted at this point. Also, certainly the need for tariffs, um, the competition that is needed um, over bringing in imported goods, so goods from other countries, is starting to also be a factor here. Also, do we need a national bank, and what role, if we do need it, should it play? And then, of course, you have other internal improvements that are being debated such as canals and roads which certainly would be adding to government spending and so as we look at this sectionalism begin to develop we're going to take a look at also the development of the american system which we'll get to here in a moment but we're going to identify three regional spokespersons that emerged in congress so we're going to start with the south and their spokesperson is kind of embodied by John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. He's going to emerge as a chief supporter of what we call state sovereignty. 
And that's the concept that states have the right to govern themselves independent of the federal government. So essentially, it helps defy the idea of federalism, which is that the federal government always outranks the states. Cal Calhoun, in fact, wanted that change so that states could make decisions about defying government laws or even different ideas of the political government. He wanted each state to retain more power. And state sovereignty is going to be something that is really going to, do, along with states' rights, drive us closer and closer to that civil war that we're getting to. And so he was a big, big opponent of any national program. He didn't like the idea of the National Bank, and he fought things um, that empowered and gave strength to the federal government. On the other hand, your North is kind of embodied um, by its um, this pre or excuse me this representative from New England, who would be Daniel Webster. He supports protective tariffs in supporting these new industries, particularly in New England, which we highlighted uh, throughout this unit, um, such as the Lowell factories. And he spoke very eloquently against sectionalism. Webster was worried that this would rip our country apart and that it would slowly erode some of these ideas that were outlined in, say, the Constitution. And then finally, for the West, your representative is Henry Clay here. He's from Kentucky. He's definitely a war hawk. He definitely had some support for the War of 1812. And he advocates, or excuse me, he advocates for the American system, which are policies to stimulate the growth of of industry and he really tried to resolve sectional disputes between particularly the North and the South because he knows that the West Western states like Kentucky for example need those parts to work together in order to benefit the United States so certainly the three regional spokespersons excuse me persons begin to emerge in Congress and again, a lot of this sectionalism is going to keep building and building until we get into the 1860s. And it's going to kind of reach its peak with the Civil War. Now, with the institution of slavery, we had seen that states entering the Union between slave states and free states, so states where slavery was not legal, and of course, states where slavery was legal had been pretty balanced. But as this country continues to grow, you see a need for balance and for compromise. So in March of 1820, the Missouri Compromise provided an admission of Missouri, which was going to become a slave state. And in exchange, Maine would enter as a free state, and that helped to keep the balance. Now, the other thing that you see is that no other states above the 36th parallel would, so no states north of that line could be slave states. But the problem is, is that that's going to limit the amount of slave states, especially given the amount of land that is north of that line. So this is not a compromise that's going to stick for very long. And it's kind of a great analogy for some of those major sectionalism issues and the debate over slavery that really, again, send us on that road down to the Civil War. Let's talk a little bit now about the U.S. defining itself within the world. So shifting gears a little bit from the internal to external. So in 1817, the Rush-Gabbitt Treaty um, in 1817, essentially, the United States and Britain are going to come together because they realize with the War of 1812 over that they need to address some of the aggression around the era, or around, excuse me, around the area in this era um, of the Great Lakes. And they're going to remove a lot of weapons that are located along the border of the United States and British Canada because they understand and they're starting to understand that neither of these countries are going to go anywhere. And while, of course, Canada is later going to gain its independence, it still has very strong roots with Great Britain. And so 
The next year, the Convention of 1818 sets that boundary with the United States and Canada at the 49th parallel, which is, of course, predominantly where it stands today, although you're going to see certainly a lot of territory south of that line is now a part of Canada. Another treaty that certainly comes about this time with Spain is the adams onis Treaty. And we could certainly talk about kind of some of the interesting backdoor deals that may have occurred that allowed John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, our second president, to become president. And he's going to continue to make some of those deals with this treaty here in 1819, the United States, after a certain young man by the name of Andrew Jackson um, invades uh, Florida in order to put down some quells with, say, the Seminole people in Florida. It's eventually going to lead towards some action, and essentially Adams says, hey, Spain, you're not doing your job. We have this agreement where you would enforce the border, and yet Seminoles have come into our into our country and raided, and we want Florida. And so essentially Spain, who at this point is really struggling to keep a lot of its empire in the Western Hemisphere afloat, agrees, and they basically um, give access to Eastern Florida, and then, of course, they abandon all of Western Florida and provide it to the United States. So by 1824, Spain had lost a lot of control over most of its territory in South America as well. And certainly we will see that a lot of this territory in the near future is going to become the empire of Mexico. But again, this is where we add Florida to the United States. The last thing we're going to talk about today is in 1823, President Monroe essentially lays out probably his most important action, which is the Monroe Doctrine, which he declares. It says that the United States is not going to interfere in any existing European colonies in the United States. However, it's not going to allow for the further colonization on either continent, North or South America. And in fact, it's going to see those actions as a hostile action that could lead to war. So this is really the United States saying, these two continents, this Western Hemisphere, we now understand that many European nations already have a foothold here and they can continue to have those, but we will have no new colonies. And that they're really trying to carve out a real important global identity as a player on the world stage. And that, of course, leads us back to where we began, which is with this image of the U.S. really saying, hands off. And again, this is our hemisphere, and we're going to help to define it. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening with us. A lot of information in this one. I appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, those of you who are listening for fun, I hope you learned something. I hope you gained some insight into U.S. history. For my students, of course, reach out if you have any questions, and I hope you've been following along with your guided notes. But I want to thank everybody for listening, and that's going to include conclude this edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History.